into the spin. All right, all right, I understand what you're saying, I really do. Sansone Varuk was shaking her head as she spoke. I know you want people to understand what assignment means, what it means that you've liberated them from the Grendel, but I think the problem is that you don't actually know what that means. Farouk was one of the original Sanite Seps, one of the gladiators from the Beerwraith Arena. She'd become an unofficial spokesperson for the people of Rathmona. She'd grown up in the vicinity, and while they were suspicious of her, they were prepared to speak to her more frankly and more openly than they were the other soldiers of the Winter Sun. We've beaten the Grendel, and now these people are free to become Imperial citizens. What don't I understand? Yantel spoke a little more hotly than he intended. Getting his emotions under control took a little effort, and he hid it by sipping her hot spiced tea. It was very good. He suspected Eft would enjoy it as well, and made a mental note to pick up some to take home with him. Sure, we know that, but the Grendel aren't the Druge. These people don't live in fear, they're not slaves, most of them. As long as they pay their taxes and keep up their levy, they just get on with stuff. You think Beerwraith cares about a shithole like Rathmona? You think the Brine Turtles even knew this place existed before they arrived here with thousands of Imperial warriors on their asses? As long as the money keeps coming in and the Jaws have a good crop of dregs each year, they just... The Sanite gestured vaguely. She shrugged. All this talk of liberation is just... It's so many words, she tried again. What the people here in Rathmona want to know is what kind of taxes we're going to impose whether their young folk are going to be conscripted into your armies, and what sort of recompense they'll get if they do end up fighting for us. What kind of stupid laws and regulations we're going to impose. Stupid laws? Yantel sputtered his tea. Look, I'm just telling you what people are saying. The Winter Sun had orders to break the chains and liberate the Sanites, and don't think those of us who were slaves aren't grateful for that. But these folk? There's no chains here. I know you imagine that the day the Winter Sun came here and liberated Rathmona was the most important day in these people's lives, but for most of them it was just another day. They don't see any difference between the Empire and the Grendel, and it's going to take a lot more than a few rousing words to get them to see that difference. Assuming there is any, of course. The last was spoken quietly, almost as if it was for Baruch alone. Yantel frowned and looked askance at his friend. He knew she'd been angered by some of the foolish comments from other soldiers during the early months of the invasion, but he thought they'd moved past it. The Sanite's face was unreadable. She gazed off into the middle distance, sipping her spiced tea. Overview The most recent season of war saw Imperial forces victorious in Mareev. Their conquest of Clisern had turned the tide in the eastern Grendel territory. It is now the business of the Imperial Senates to assign the territory to one of the Imperial nations. Recent victories in territories as diverse as Skarsind, Holberg, Segura and the Mornwald have been reasonably straightforward. These were territories that had been imperial in the past and where numbers of imperial citizens lived. Mareeve, however, is more like Ossium and the Barons, territories that have never been part of the Empire before. The Barons had long had a Dornish presence, but the citizens of Dawnguard were far from the majority. When Ossium was conquered, there were no imperial citizens and the territory had no history of ever being Varushkin. While Varushkins have settled there since then, it took a year or more of careful work by politicians and priests to settle many of the issues. Mareeve represents a similar level of challenge. The territory has no imperial citizens and few humans. The Grendel and the Orcs of the Broken Shore are, at best, highly suspicious of imperial invaders. The climate and geography themselves are unwelcoming, arid and dry. Yet at the same time the territory contains hidden wealth. The mines in the eastern mountains and hills burst with precious metal, and the port city of Beerwraith apparently welcomes traders from across the known world. Whichever nation embraces Marie will have its work cut out to ensure that the territory, in turn, embraces them back. Assignment and Allocation To assist with the assignment, the Civil Service has asked the Speaker for the Senate to raise an administrative motion during the Saturday evening session. Any Senator can then make a case for the territory to be assigned to their nation. Once the debate is concluded, the Speaker will invite Senators to vote on which of the options presented they wish to support. If the Senate does not want to assign the territory at this time, they may vote for no nation. If this happens, the Civil Service will raise the administrative motion again at the summer solstice. Regardless of the outcome, there will be no senatorial election at the summit where the territory is assigned. It takes time to arrange a senatorial election. The senatorial election will be arranged for the summit after the assignment is concluded. This delay will not impede the ability to perform rituals affecting Marie from the Imperial Regio. At the point the territory became eligible to appoint a senator, the metaphysical rules governing the Regio at Anvil make it possible to affect the territory even though it has not yet been assigned. Regardless of whether they assign the territory or not, the Senate may choose to allocate the Fundendel Mithril Mine. 
As with the crawling depths, if they allocated the miners a national position without assigning the territory, they would need to choose an imperial nation to take temporary custody of it. This does not tie the hands of the Senate, however. Once the territory were assigned, the mine would automatically become the legal responsibility of whichever nation takes control of Mareev. If the mithril mine is allocated during the spring equinox, it will be available for appointment at the summer solstice for a single season before falling into the usual pattern of autumn appointment alongside the other mithril resources. It is worth remembering that neither assignment nor allocation are constitutional motions. They do not require ratification, although the throne could use their veto as normal, and it would be a matter for the General Assembly if the Synod veto was sought. Expectation Management when it comes to assigning Mareev or any new territory, there are no wrong answers and no best answer. Any nation who has assigned this territory is going to face challenges. The nature of those challenges and the opportunities that will accompany them will be influenced by who the territory is assigned to. Integrating a new territory into the empire will usually take a great deal of time and involve significant challenges. Every territory is different and the challenges will be different each time. The outcome is never guaranteed, but we aim to make those challenges as much fun as possible for people who want to engage with them, and to be potentially achievable regardless of which nation takes on the challenge. Dealing with the orcs who live in Mareev is one of the challenges that must be addressed here. Even if a peaceful accommodation is made with them, that doesn't mean they will want to become part of any imperial nation. At present, the bulk of the people in Mareev have no interest in joining any imperial nation and no desire to move anywhere else. The Fine Art of Assignment the Senate has a free choice as to which nation to assign Mareev to. It could be assigned to any of the ten nations of the Empire. In particular, it's important to recognise that the territory need not be contiguous with the nation it is assigned to. At the moment, the territories of most nations adjoin each other, but this is largely an accident of history and geography. There is no reason that imperial citizens may not find homes in any territory. The Navarre and the League already demonstrate how a modern imperial nation can maintain and develop territories scattered widely across the Empire. It's also not relevant which nation's armies were involved in conquering the territory. The Military Council is an imperial body that makes strategic decisions based on the many different threats facing the Empire. That the Brass Coast armies have been busy fighting on the western side of the Bay of Catazar, or that the Golden Axe was at the forefront of the initial conquest, are not legally significant. Challenges The civil service has had a limited amount of time to codify the precise challenges that will be faced by whichever imperial nation takes control of Mareev. They've barely started their assessment, and what little they have been able to nail down has been done with the aid of the captains supporting the Mareev spy network, and the soldiers of the Imperial armies who have been fighting in the territory. It's likely some territories will find certain challenges easier to address than others, but all of them will need to be overcome if Mareev is to become a strong part of the Empire. Grendel Opposition As the historians of the Department of Historical Research laid out in Mareev and Urizen, the Grendel have dominated Mareev since the time of Emperor Nicovar. The Fundendelve is a major source of Mithril, and the Grendel Salt Lords seem to value Mithril over everything, save perhaps Weirwood. Like Kaliax before him, former Salt Lord Assan's place on the ruling council of the Grendel was contingent on control of the Mithril mine, which is now reasonably firmly in Imperial hands. Even leaving aside the fact that three regions of the territory remain at least notionally in the hands of the Grendel, it is very unlikely that the Grendel plan to give up on Mareev without a fight. Unlike Spiral, which they have been understandably cautious about invading despite developments in Apulian, they are certain to attempt to reclaim the territory. Even if it can be held in the short term, Marie will form a frontier with the Grendel in the same way Spiral once did. Indeed, there is some news beginning to filter into Imperial lands that there is not one but two Grendel-held territories adjacent to southern Marie, underlining the need for the Imperial Military Council to give careful thoughts to how the territory might best be protected. Orc Inhabitants there are humans in Mareev, but apart from a handful of former Imperial slaves, none of them seem to have any real connection to the Imperial nations. Some of the free humans may once have originated in the Brass Coast, Highgard, Urzen, Scaura, or the League, but they no longer feel any association with those nations. They also don't really have their own settlements, being mixed in with the Orc population when they appear. Most live as mercenaries, fighting for the Grendel in return for coin and a smidgen of prestige. The vast majority of the people in Mareev are Orcs. They can be very roughly divided into three broad categories. Those in the north, in Ikarian, Nadir, Iridal, and perhaps Sinfiad, are smaller, independent septs or communities of broken shore orcs. Subjects of the Grendel, many of them lived as slaves before being liberated by imperial armies, especially the Winter Sun, during the invasion. It would be a mistake to assume these orcs welcomed the Empire's soldiers. 
For the most part, though, they aren't especially organised. They represent loose communities of hunters, subsistence farmers, miners and prospectors. The Grendel proper, the sophisticated wealthy orcs who rule Atar and the Broken Shore, still control Beerwraith and its prosperous port city, and once occupied wealthy estates in Clisern. Those who haven't been killed fighting the Empire have retreated, either to the city of former Salt Lord Asan, or fled south to seek sanctuary among the Brine Turtles, or their neighbours in Eyreed, or whatever Grendel lands lie to the southeast of the territory. Finally, there are the Brine Turtles, the organised, powerful sept of orcs who make up the majority of one of the orc armies that shares their name. They control the region of Flesarth, and while they aren't especially fond of Asan or his fellows, they also have no love at all for the Empire. It's also notable that if the Empire intends to continue to conquer the Broken Shore, they will need to either enlist the aid of the Brine Turtles, or conquer their homeland on the southern borders of the territory. None of these orcs are followers of the Way. Many of them recognise the so-called Grendel virtues to one degree or another. Many more honour their ancestors, especially Ruacraig the Stormlord. The Empire would underestimate the influence this legendary reaver and pirate has over the Orcs of Mareev at its peril. Some of these Orcs have already joined the Sanite Sept of the Imperial Orcs. It's possible that more will do so in the coming months, among the smaller Northern Septs. A few will seek a fresh start in Skarsund, and some will want to stay in the land they know well. The prospect of trekking all the way to an alpine wilderness in the north is hardly appealing to people familiar with the heat of Mareev. However, most of the Orcs here have no interest in becoming Imperial Orcs, any more than they have an interest in becoming Urza and Dornish or Winterfolk. Whatever else happens, the nation that is assigned control of Mareev will need to address the challenge of the people who already live here. Dry Land and Economics Mareev experiences a similar climate to parts of the Brass Coast. The southern regions, especially Flesarth and Clisern, are similar to Karaman or Segura, dry, parched grasslands. The northern regions, Ikarian, Nadir, Iridal and Sinfayard, are much drier and more desolate than any freeborn land. The scattered settlements are usually centred around a well that provides life-giving water and is used to irrigate farms of hardy root vegetables. Individual communities guard their water jealously, but the wealthier groups may trade small amounts to each other in the same way an imperial town might trade its surplus goods. Clisern, Flesarth and Beerwraith, by contrast, are relatively fertile, with a similar pattern of farms to those found in Segura or Feroz. Unfortunately, two of these three regions are still in barbarian hands. Supporting imperial citizens here will be a challenge without access to the food raised in these regions, although, as the Urzen have proved with the assistance of the marchers, that doesn't mean it would be impossible. Regardless of which nation the territory is assigned to, it won't increase the ability of that nation to support an army. Getting the territory to the point where it might do so will require a lot of work to establish an imperial population capable of supporting a new army, assuming it's ever possible. Whichever nation claims the territory will need to develop sources of food if they are to exploit the valuable natural resources of Mareev and establish an imperial presence. Far Frontier The final immediate challenge is that the territory lies far from the centre of the Empire. By land it is easily accessible only via the Apulian Way through Spiral. As long as the region of Apulis is in Imperial hands, that isn't a major problem, but anyone wanting to trade with Mareev or immigrate to the territory by land will need to brave the threat of the Black Plateau for several days. It's possible to reach the territory by sea, of course, but the only accessible harbour here is the city of Beerwraith. The rest of the coast is high and rocky, similar to Sanctuary Sands in Necropolis or the high bluffs of Tamari in Optarian. This isolation creates particular challenges from a strategic point of view because armies suffer when they spend too much time in Spiral. It's likely that significant fortifications will be needed to secure the borders. Such construction brings to mind the other obvious problem for building in Mareev. Any wanes of white granite or weirwood will need to be imported, and the expense of doing so via spiral will likely impact any commission in the territory. Establishing a way to import and export people and goods will be an issue that any imperial nation will need to address. The Former Salt Lord One thing the Empire has already noticed is that the people here are very political in nature. There's already been signs of deep divides between the various Orc factions and with the rest of the Grendel. Imperial heroes have already dabbled in the politics of Mareev, and shortly before the Spring Equinox there is a further development involving the former Salt Lord ruler of Beerwraith, Asan. While the people of Beerwraith are not prepared to surrender to the Empire, or betray their ancestors in the manner of the former Salt Lord of Apulis, they are still apparently very angry indeed with their fellow Grendel. Asan has sent emissaries to the armies, indicating that if the Empire will use a declaration of peace to recognise him and his people as foreigners, then he is prepared to withdraw all forces under his control to Beerwraith and Sinfayard. He and those who look to him for leadership will cease all hostilities, looking to the defence of their city and lands against possible reprisals from his former peers. 
They won't contest imperial control of Marive and will be neutral to both sides in the conquest of the Broken Shore. In addition to offering interesting military intelligence that might allow the Empire to neutralize the threat of the Brine Turtles, Asan has issued an edict freeing the handful of slaves remaining in Beerwraith and Synfiard. Their statements offer some insight into a matter that has apparently been a growing problem for some time. Slaves have been increasingly hard to procure, and prices have spiralled as a result. While a few salt lords have clung to old practices, the smart ones, like Asan, have switched to employing folk to do the work. Asan is completely sanguine about this fact. They and their fellow salt lords don't see this as a moral issue, just a simple matter of profit and loss. If the Senate does recognise the Orcs of Beerwraith and Synfiad as foreigners, which they can do with a single Senate motion, then Asan says there will be ample opportunity to discuss trade treaties once the fighting in Marive is done. They're also prepared to offer sanctuary to any broken shore orcs who do not wish to become subjects of the Empire, which might avoid further bloodshed. It would also be possible to recognize the broken shore orcs in the northern regions as foreigners at the same time, with the same motion. This would be the first step towards establishing peaceful contact with the minor septs of Ikaria, Nadir, and Iridal. It would prevent the Imperial armies attacking these orcs, but it wouldn't impede their ability or the ability of Imperial citizens to defend themselves if they were attacked. In theory, depending on the outcome of any engagement with the Brine Turtles during the Spring Equinox, it would be possible to simply declare all the Orcs of Marie to be foreigners with the same provisos. Those prepared, in the words of the Emperor, to accept the offer of friendship may be able to find a way to live alongside the Empire in peace, while those who choose to reject that offer and continue to fight will be met with blade, bow and shield. Note. Declaring any faction of Marie to be foreigners will make it a crime for any general to issue orders to attack them or their homes. If Asan and his people are recognised as foreigners, it will be a crime to attack Beerwraith or Synfiad. If the Brine Turtle are recognised as foreigners, it will be a crime to attack Forsyth with armies, unless the Brine Turtle have surrendered the region.